Hello, church family. It is a delight to be able to be with you today, even if it has to be through these compromised means. And as you can see, I'm coming to you today from the room that I wish all of us were in, and that Lord willing, one day we will be gathered together as a church family back in this room. Uh, you probably have already seen uh, the little video I made the other day about what our comeback uh, to worship together will look like. If you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to watch that. And uh, as we begin to work towards that return date, we're beginning to do things here even in preparation for that. And so I am able to come to you today from, from this very familiar room where we come together to worship. Just a bit of a programming note for what's going to be coming in the, in the weeks ahead. Uh, next Lord's Day, Pastor Wes will be bringing the message. And then the Sunday after that, uh, I'll be back and we'll be finishing up our study in the book of Daniel with chapter 6. And then the week after that will be June 7th when we begin to have services here in person again, Lord willing. Not quite sure yet what we'll be looking at in God's Word during that time, but uh, have a few weeks to work to work on that, but looking forward to that. But today we are anxious to be able to open Daniel chapter 5 again and finish it up. So if you don't have a Bible, I'd ask that you go get one and let's open it and look into it as we come to our time together in God's Word. And as we do so, let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Would you, would you pray with me? Gracious, kind, loving, and forgiving Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, God, grateful for those attributes and all of the other attributes of, of who you are. God, you are beyond our ability to fully comprehend and understand in your greatness, in your power, and in your majesty. And we come together, Lord, in these days, and we worship you. We bow down before you. And Lord, in this moment, we come to you and ask that you would feed us. You know the need of every individual heart and mind. And God, it is my prayer that through your spirit and through your word, you would do a work in the heart of your children. Father, I pray that I speak as I speak today, that you would work through my words I pray that you would chain me, that you would hold me accountable to your word, and that I would rightly divide it today. Oh God, my prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you. God, work in us as a church family. Minister to us in these days. Work for our good. Work for the glory of your name. We pray this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Well, just a few words of review to bring us up to where we are in Daniel chapter 5. You know that Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, is on the throne. And one of the early things that this young king has done here in the city of Babylon is thrown a party in the palace. And this party pulled out all of the stops. And this party is full of drunkenness, it's full of lewdness full of perversion, it's full of sacrilege. And the, the height of that sacrilege, the height of that irreverence came when the king asked for the sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought out, and they used those vessels, they drank from those vessels in toasting the pagan deities of Babylon. And at that moment, at the height of that irreverence, God enters into the situation through the form of a disembodied hand that writes four words on the wall in the palace. And terror fills the room. The room falls silent at that moment as this hand writes on the wall. The king is now immediately sobered and calls in his wise men to come in and interpret why these four words have been written on the wall, but they are unable to. And so the king here is terrified. Hearing what has gone on down here at this party, the grace-filled and dignified queen mother enters into the situation the situation that her son has gotten himself into. 
And she directs her son's attention to a very wise man who was a great help to the young king's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. She points him to Daniel. She talks about how much of a help Daniel was in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, how he has the spirit of the gods in him, and that he needs the counsel of this wise man. And so then and only then is Daniel brought in to this situation. He is summoned. Now I want you to take a moment and pause the video and I want you to read the words that the king speaks to Daniel when he comes into the room. They're found in verses 13 through 16. So pause the video and read the words of the king to Daniel. As you read those words, I don't believe that you hear a great deal of respect for Daniel. In fact, I think that the young king is very condescending to Daniel. I don't think he wants this Jew to be the one who gives him the answer, who interprets what the writing on the wall means. Apparently, somewhere along the line, Daniel has been demoted. He no longer is in this very high and privileged position in the nation of Babylon. He has been set out to pasture, it looks like, not seen as valuable by these young and upcoming leaders that are now ruling Babylon. And what a, what a sad commentary on how someone like Daniel is, is treated. And, and, and we see that so often happening even in our day that those with age and wisdom are pushed aside and it is the young and the hip and the cool that are giving the direction. And we see in this circumstance, as we so often do even now, that there is so much wisdom and so much to be offered by those that are older. But Belshazzar didn't want anything to do with Daniel and it's, it's only now that Daniel comes in. But even notice how the king speaks to Daniel. Verse 13, you are that Daniel. One of the exiles, one of the slaves that my granddad brought back from Jerusalem. You are one of those. He uses his Jewish name, not in the same way that the queen mother did. I think there's a tone of condescension here. He's letting everyone in the room know you're one of those Jews, uses his Babylonian name. You are that Daniel. Belshazzar even acts like he doesn't even know who Daniel is. But I believe he had to know who Daniel was. He had to at least know of him if he didn't know who Daniel was. I mean, we're going to find out in a minute that Belshazzar knew the events of Nebuchadnezzar's life. He knew his rise, he knew his fall, he knew his return to the king, and it's impossible to know of that without knowing Daniel. And then when chapter 2 ends, Daniel has this incredibly high position in the kingdom of Babylon. Chapter 2 ended by saying that Daniel ruled over the province of Babylon and that he was the chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. I mean, Daniel was incredibly high in the kingdom, and so I find it impossible to think that Belshazzar doesn't know who he is. I don't think he wants to know who he is. I think he wants to keep this Jewish slave, this old man, at arm's length. So in verses 14 and 16, when it says, I have heard that you can do this, I think there's a tinge of disdain in Belshazzar's voice. Now he wants to know the meaning. I think that's the only reason he acquiesces and brings Daniel in. It's as if the king is saying, I don't know who you are, but I've heard that you can do not that you can do what my wise men are unable to do. And if you're able to do it, I'll give you the purple and I'll give you the golden chain and I'll make you the third ruler in Babylon, the third highest ruler in Babylon. I mean, Daniel at this time is between 80 and 90 years old. There, there couldn't be a greater contrast between Daniel and everyone else in this room. Daniel, who has walked with God since the days of his youth, 
and has been faithful, has been a man of prayer. We're going to see that in the next chapter. He's been so distinguished in his career. And now he's been put out to pasture. And all of these young people are are ruling. They don't want anything to do with this old Jewish man of God. I picture Daniel patiently listening to the king as he speaks to him. And then as the king finishes, all of the eyes of the room are on Daniel. And as all of their eyes are on Daniel, Daniel's eyes are on the king. And Daniel looks at the king and he speaks. And Daniel actually has quite a bit to say to the king. It's quite a lengthy discourse that Daniel gives to the king. And what I'd like for you to do now is pause and and read that discourse that Daniel gives to the king. Verses 17 to 28. If you pause and, and read those now. You know, the first words out of Daniel's mouth to the king are, in essence, keep your stuff. Keep your stuff. I don't want any of it. I don't want the purple. I don't want the gold chain. I don't want the position. I don't want any of it. Daniel is a true man of God. And a man of God cannot be bought. He doesn't have a price. Privilege, position, power, those things are dangled before Daniel and he is unmoved by them. He's not influenced by what he can gain. As one author said, Daniel is not a mercenary minister. Daniel will not use the abilities that God has given to him to prostitute his services for power or position. Far more important to Daniel than all of those things that are being offered to him is the reputation of God. He's more concerned about the reputation of God than he is with personal gain. And so by separating himself from the gain, from all of this that's being offered, Daniel separates himself from that. And so he maintains a purity and a freedom in speaking to the king. He's not influenced by anything. The only thing that Daniel is influenced by is God himself. And when you are uninfluenced by all that the world has to offer, there is a sweet freedom. And Daniel will maintain that freedom. He is uninfluenced by the things of the world. He operates on a totally different level. Level And that just sets the tone for how things are going to go. And remember, everybody in the room is watching this. Keep your stuff. Keep your stuff, Daniel says. He then says that he will give the interpretation for the words that have been written on the wall. But he has a few other things that he would like to say to the young king before he gets to the words on the wall. And let me give you what I think is the summary of Daniel's message to Belshazzar. I think his message is basically this. We shouldn't be here right now. We shouldn't be here right now. None of this should be happening. This party shouldn't be happening. You shouldn't be wondering about these words on the wall, this fear that you are gripped with right now. None of this should be happening. We shouldn't be here right now because you had every opportunity to avoid this, and you ignored it. You had every opportunity to avoid this, and you ignored it. And then Daniel goes on and he rehearses the account of Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. And in beautiful detail, Daniel shares with the young king how his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, was given from the Most High God greatness and glory and majesty. And that everyone feared Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. Everybody followed him. He built majestic kingdoms and everybody was in awe of Nebuchadnezzar. There was none like him in all of the world. But Daniel shares how pride filled Nebuchadnezzar's heart and God humbled him. How God took away everything 
and sent Nebuchadnezzar out into the wilderness for seven periods of time where he discovered that the Most High God rules and that no mortal man can ever be equal in greatness and power to God. And then after Daniel rehearses everything that happened to Nebuchadnezzar, he brings down the most indicting statement of all in verse 22. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. That's one of the key phrases in this chapter. You knew all of this. You knew everything that happened to your grandfather. You knew all of it. You knew what pride did to your grandfather. You knew the fall that he experienced. You knew his confession. You knew that your grandfather stated that praise and honor belong to the King of Heaven and that all of his works are right and his ways are just. You knew all of it, Belshazzar, and you ignored it. You ignored it. You exalted yourself. You blasphemed God by drinking from the sacred vessels. You worshipped idols that can't see hear or know anything and you walked away from the God who holds your very breath Daniel says you have made foolish decision after foolish decision after foolish decision and you should have known better we shouldn't be here right now we shouldn't be here because you knew. It's a powerful moment. Daniel in these statements has preached a powerful sermon to Belshazzar and, and everyone else in the room. He's preached the paint off the walls. We shouldn't be here because you knew. You knew it all and you paid it no heed. This is why the hand appeared. You refuse to learn from all of that. You, you looked to the idols who don't see or speak or know. And so now the God of heaven has broken into your life through this hand writing on the wall because you didn't listen. And then Daniel gives the interpretation of what was written on the wall. We find this in verse 26. This is the interpretation of the matter, Daniel says. Mine, which had been written twice for emphasis, means God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tikal, the second word written, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's a devastating interpretation. Your, your number is up is the first word. It's in essence what that is saying. Your number is up. You, you have been weighed in the scale and you got nothing. You have absolutely nothing to offer Belshazzar. And so your kingdom will be divided. In other words, your judgment day has come. Your judgment day has come, Belshazzar. And I find verse 29 to be incredibly sorrowful. After that interpretation is given to Belshazzar, that, that your number is up and that you've got nothing on the scales to, to offer to Almighty God, you've done absolutely nothing, and that the kingdom is going to be taken from you, what Belshazzar does next, I find incredibly sad. Look at what the king does, verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command... And Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. How terribly sad. I picture Daniel with his head bowed and maybe even shaken a bit as the gold chain is put on him and as the cloak is put on him. And Daniel must be thinking to himself, Belshazzar, you are crowning 
the wrong person. You are crowning the wrong person. Oh, that in that moment, Belshazzar would have fallen before Daniel and said, what do I do? And plead with the God of heaven for forgiveness and plead with the God of heaven for mercy, but that is not what he does. Even though Daniel has rehearsed all that Nebuchadnezzar went through and how Nebuchadnezzar, when he did humble himself, was blessed by God, but in his pride, he doesn't do it. Oh, that he would have crowned the right person in that moment. But that's not what he does. And the text goes on to tell us how that very night, Darius the Mede comes into the heavily fortified Babylon and takes the city. Because you see, while this party was going on, the Medes were up the Euphrates River building a dam and diverting the water. And the moat that went around the city of Babylon was lowered as they had dammed up that water and they sneak in underneath and they take the city because its leader was distracted with selfish gain and he loses the kingdom. It's gone. Mighty Babylon falls. As, as I reflect on this passage, I notice very clearly that Daniel holds Belshazzar accountable because God had revealed himself to him through the life of his grandfather. You knew all of this, Daniel said. You should have known how to behave because God had revealed himself through the life of your grandfather. So as I think about that in relation to us, friends, God has revealed himself to us as well. We, we have in this book the fullness of the revelation of God to us. Everything God wants us to know about himself has been revealed to us in this book. Herein, in this book, we read about the pride of man and his fall. Here in this book, we see our deservedness of punishment and removal from God's presence forever to hell because of our sinful rebellion. That, that's been revealed to us in this book. We, we know here in this book, we read about the one sent from heaven to take the punishment that we rightly deserve. We read about the one who suffered on our behalf. We read about our ability to surrender our lives to Him and be saved. Have we not said the words of John so many times, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in His name. All of that has been revealed to us. And we know we know these things, and therefore, we have no excuse. As the day of judgment came for Belshazzar, it will come for us. It will come for us. And to everyone in the sound of my voice, and to everyone who has a copy of this book, it can be said of us, we knew. We knew. It had all been revealed to us. You know, there's a brief little account in the New Testament of, of Jesus speaking that is absolutely terrifying. Jesus is going from town to town, as you know, in the Gospels, and he's ministering, and he's teaching, and he's, and he's healing, and he's doing all of these miraculous things. And there were some towns where he did a lot of miracles. He, he revealed to an even greater degree his power and, and, and who he was. And Jesus says something interesting to those towns that saw a greater degree of miraculous activity. 
In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, we read this. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you. In other words, cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida, you ignored the miracles. All that I did in your presence, the revelation that was given to you, you ignored. And so the punishment will be greater for you. Lehman Strauss in his commentary said, sin is sin. It, it, it is all an affront to God. Sin is sin, but guilt and punishment are proportionate to knowledge. To know and reject is far worse than to have never known at all. And as you listen to this this morning, as you hear this message from the Word of God, you are accountable for what you know. And how gracious of God to reveal Himself to us because you know, friend, if, if, if our works were put on the scale like Belshazzar's, we come up empty as well. We've got nothing to offer. When, when the day of judgment comes, if our works are piled on the scale, if our morality, if our good works are put on the scale, just like Belshazzar, we come up empty. We come up wanting. As the song says, nothing in my hand I can bring. So simply to the cross, I cling. For the one who clings to Jesus, it's not my works that are put on the scale. It's his. He stands in my place. He is my substitute. He is my rescuer. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. And so we look to Jesus and His righteousness. Friend, if you have not yet surrendered to Jesus, come to Him for the forgiveness of your sins. I implore you, come today. Come to Him. Surrender to Him. Believe in His death and believe in His resurrection through which you have eternal life. God so loved the world that He gave His Son, and whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Friend, you know. You know the truth. Let the truth set you free. For just like the day of judgment came for Belshazzar, it will come for you, and it will come for me. And if you're standing in your own strength, you will be found wanting. But if you stand in Christ, you will be found to have everything you need. Oh God, take your word, your truths, press them down deep into our hearts. Oh Lord God, thank you for Jesus in whom we have everything. We pray this in Christ's glorious name. Amen. God be with you till we meet again.